Hello and welcome to this uh, lecture. So, we will take a slight deviation uh, from what we have done so far and uh, we will actually look at uh, something known as hardware security. So, hardware security is uh, quite an upcoming field um, and uh, it actually deals with security in chips, uh, processors and so on. Since this is at the base of your computer system, the security of these hardware could actually impact uh, all the things which come above it. So, for example, a flaw in your hardware uh, could actually be used to steal or compromise everything uh, about that hardware like the BIOS operating systems and the various applications. So, there are uh, hardware security itself is a very broad field. Um, so, we will be starting this video with a very uh, with something known as physically unclonable functions or buffs. Uh, so, these there will be multiple such videos. So, this is the first part of it. Uh, essentially, we will be actually looking at uh, this paper or we will be uh, discussing this paper called physically unclonable functions and applications a tutorial. So, you can download this paper from uh, this IEEE website. Uh, a major application for puffs uh, is for authentication. So, um, authentication especially for edge device uh, devices like um, I which are used for IoT uh, is extremely important. The reason being that uh, there are like thousands of IoTs that are expected to be uh, deployed in the next few years. Uh, all of these uh, devices are low power, uh, they have small footprints, uh, memory footprints and are quite often uh, connected to sensors and actuators uh, in uh, process control plants. Now, the problem with having such a low characteristic or a low profile is that uh, a lot of the cryptographic algorithms will not work on this. Several of especially the public key cryptographic algorithms are quite complex and uh, therefore, uh, would require considerable amount of compute power and memory uh, to in order to execute. Therefore, authenticating these devices is actually a problem. The second uh, uh, issue is that uh, authentication of these devices cannot be ignored. The fact is that uh, these edge devices are quite critically connected to various components of a process control system. Uh, it, it could for example, uh, be connected to uh, some of the actuators or uh, monitoring elements in a say nuclear thermal plant. And therefore, the data or the processing which is actually collected by this device is extremely important for the functioning or the correctness of the entire plant. Other features of these devices is that it has to operate 24 7 and it is completely unmanned and uh, therefore, the security of these devices are extremely important. Now, the typical way to actually authenticate these devices is to store a secret key in flash device or a ROM device present in this device. So, this secret key would then be used to uh, with lightweight ciphers, uh, there are several lightweight ciphers which are being developed. So, one of these uh, ciphers would be used uh, to actually do encryptions and then there would be a authentication protocol with a server. The server would also have uh, the same private keys for all the devices that it is connected to and um, it would send uh, it would ha during the handshake or during the connection between the server and this edge device, uh, the private keys would be used to authenticate the validity of this device. So, a similar type of private keys you would see also in various other devices like smart cards, uh, credit cards and so on. And uh, all of these devices essentially have a, a large random uh, number which is stored, uh, which is then used to identify the device. The problem with uh, this approach is that this private keys stored in the device uh, need requires a special memory known as the E squared PROM, which uh, is considerably overhead especially to manufacturer. Uh, further, uh, as uh, many of you would know, uh, smart cards and other uh, such low end devices can be easily cloned or copied. So, this means that I could actually clone uh, this particular hardware create another hardware which has exactly the same private key. The issue with this is that now I would have two devices uh, and both are can be authenticated by the sem same server because they would have the same private key uh, in them. Essentially both are clones of each other. 
quite recently there has been a new technique uh, which was suggested to replace the use of private keys uh, as a means to authenticate device. So, this is known as uh, the physically unclonable functions. So, physically unclonable functions uh, can be used for authenticating uh, devices. It does not have uh, require any stored keys, uh, typically would not require any public key cryptography and furthermore it also alleviates the uh, drawbacks of uh, uh, authentication with stored keys. So, uh, using physically unclonable functions, uh, it is not possible to actually clone a device and uh, therefore, you get much better security. Now, uh, what are physically unclonable functions? So, essentially these physically unclonable functions are uh, something like uh, digital fingerprints, uh, which can uniquely identify a device. They are based on nanoscale uh, variations in uh, which are present during the manufacture of the device. So, we will see this a uh, little more detail in a later slide. So, basically a puff is a function, it takes an input known as a challenge and provides an output which is known as the response. However, the way it is different from other uh, functions uh, is that the response not only depends on the input challenge that is given, but also on the device where uh, the uh, function is executed in. So, for example, let us say that I have a puff function and this exactly same function is implemented in four different uh, devices as shown over here. If I give the same input to all of the four functions, what I would expect is four responses and uh, all of these responses would be different. So, what this means is that given a particular challenge, I can use the response to essentially identify which device has executed that particular function. So, note that this is very different uh, from any other function like the sine function or cos function or any other function that you typically implement uh, as a C program or uh, any software or app hardware. Over there for a given input independent of the device, you would get the same output. However, with a puff the outputs would differ uh, based on which device uh, is executing that puff function. So, this feature of puffs is uh, what is actually used to authenticate a device. Now, there have been several puffs uh, which have uh, been proposed over the last uh, 10 to 15 years or so and uh, uh, therefore, there has been a various classification and uh, ranking of these puffs to actually assign some puffs as a good puff or some as bad puffs and so on. So, typically what is expected of a puff is that if I have two devices which are exactly identical and I provide the same challenge uh, to both devices, then what a puff function should do is that it should provide a response which is different. Essentially each device should provide a unique response for the same challenge. Further, the difference between uh, this response should be, um, uh, should be significant. So, this is known as the inter uh, difference and uh, another requirement for a puff is the intra difference. This means that if I take a particular device, say device A, send it a particular challenge and obtain its response and after some time send the challenge to, ex, uh, to the same device and collect the response. Now, what is expected of a good puff is that these two responses taken from the same device after a period of time should be as close as possible or should be exactly identical. So, uh, this is a feature which is known as reliability of a puff and uh, therefore, these two would actually form uh, the most critical aspects for uh, gauging the strength of a puff. The puff should not only be reliable, but also should provide unique uh, responses with respect to different challenges and different devices. Another feature which is important uh, for in a good puff is the unpredictability. What this means is that the ability to actually provide the current response to a challenge should require the presence of the device. So, for example, if I provide a challenge and I obtain a response, I should be guaranteed that this response is actually originated from uh, that device and uh, not from some other uh, 
algorithm or some other uh, technique. So someone could actually predict the response for the puff for uh, that particular challenge. So these are the three things, the uniqueness, reli reliability and the uh, unpredictability that is required for every puff. So many of these things are orthogonal to uh, each other and achieving all three at this in the same puff is an extremely challenging uh, problem. And uh, a lot of researchers are actually working on this to actually create or design puffs which could achieve all of these three features. As mentioned before, so there are a lot of puffs which have been uh, proposed over the last uh, 15 to 20 years. Type of puffs which are actually being used uh, quite often these days are something known as intrinsic puffs. So these are puffs which can be completely uh, implemented within a chip. That is, you would have the puff function, uh, the measurement circuit to actually measure the response and also uh, post -process processing is all present within that single chip. Most puffs that we use these days or which most pu puffs which are actually considered these days are all intrinsic puffs. So uh, in this uh, video lectures, we will actually look at two puffs. These are the two most common puffs uh, which are evaluated and used uh, these days. So this is the arbiter puff and uh, something known as the ring oscillator puff. So uh, we will start with uh, a ring oscillator and we will show how a ring oscillator can be used as a puff. So uh, essentially, uh, you could consider a ring oscillator that looks something like this. So it has an AND gate over here and an enable. So whenever there is an enable, that is whenever the enable is set to 1, uh, this AND gate would pass the other signal through, right. And uh, besides this, there are a odd number of uh, inverters that are present. And finally, there is a feedback from the output uh, to the AND gate. So let us say that the en enable bit is set to 1 and let us assume that uh, the other input has a value 0 and therefore the output of this AND gate would also be 0. So this gets, this 0 gets inverted to 1, uh, then 0 and then 1 again and then there is, there is a feedback. So now your input to the AND gate has changed from 0 to 1 and uh, the result of this is that uh, 1 uh, gets converted to 0, then 1 and 0 over here. And, uh, uh, the output changes to 0 again. So what we see is happening here is that this output continuously changes from 0 to 1 and so on. So it essentially creates a periodic uh, output uh, of 1 and 0. Now uh, it would look, the output would look something like this. The uh, frequency of the output depends on uh, multiple factors. First, it depends on uh, the number of not gates that are present uh, in this ring oscillator. Uh, for example, if you have more number of uh, inverter gates, uh, then the frequency would be of this uh, waveform would be lower because essentially the, 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 the signal takes a longer time to propagate to the output. Another aspect which is uh, influences the frequency of this uh, ring oscillator output is the delay of each stage. So for example, if uh, the delay of each inverter present is very short, then uh, the signal would take a shorter time to uh, reach the output and, and as a result you would get a higher frequency. On the other hand, if uh, the delay of each inverter is long, uh, then the frequency of uh, the ring oscillator output will be much smaller. So we could actually write the frequency of the ring oscillator puff like this. So f is equal to 1 by 2 nt. As you increase n, the number of stages in the ring oscillator or uh, t, the delay of each stage, the frequency of uh, the output of the ring oscillator would reduce and vice versa. So while it is easy to understand that uh, n, that is the number of stages in the ring oscillator affects the frequency, the delay of each inverter uh, that is T actually depends on the fabrication process of these gates. So if we look at a typical uh, MOS gate uh, as uh, many of us know, uh, so it has a source, a drain and gate and that uh, is a channel established between the source and drain depending on uh, the voltage available at the gate. 
A CMOS inverter uh, looks something like this. You have an NMOS and a PMOS transistor which are uh, connected in this manner and uh, what you see is that when the input at the gate, you know, when the input uh, goes from 1 to 0, uh, the output changes from 0 to 1. So, during the fabrication of trans these transistors and gates, there could be multiple different ways one CMOS inverter differs from the other uh, CMOS inverter. Uh, these could be due to the silicon wafers that are used because no silicon wafers would be exactly identical. It could also be due to other factors uh, such as uh, the doping con concentration, uh, the oxide thickness and so on, uh, which is going to be unique for each transistor. As a result of this, uh, there be minor variations in the threshold voltage for each and every gate that is manufactured. So, what I mean by this is that if I take uh, two transistors which have been fabricated by exactly the same process and you could also assume that these transi transistors are, are manufactured one after the other. Still there are minor nanoscale variations between these two transistors and as a result of this the behavior of these transistors when added to circuits such as a CMOS inverter would vary very marginally. So, it is this marginal difference that causes the delays in the ring oscillator due to the T part and uh, this uh, is what is used by puffs uh, to extract the signature for that particular device. So, this is how a typical ring oscillator puff is used. So, note that we had looked at a ring oscillator that is this part over here comprising of the AND gate and uh, multiple odd number of uh, inverters and uh, in order to bring a build a ring oscillator puff, you would use many such ring oscillators and two multiplexers. So, in this particular slide, we have shown that we have used n ring oscillators, uh, we have two multi uh, multiplexers and a counter and uh, a one bit response. So, depending on the characteristic of each puff, the response would be either 1 or 0. So, we will not go into details about uh, this and how this uh, ring oscillator puff actually works. This we will actually keep for the next video. In the next lecture, we will also look at arbiter puffs and uh, we will also compare uh, uh, the ring oscillator puff and the arbiter puffs and see what are the characteristics and where each one can be used. Thank you.